This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Hey guys, Maven here. Today, I'm gonna fill you in on a little bit of WWE backstage culture, Wrestler's Court. This video is gonna talk all about a little bit of history of what Wrestler's Court was, the cases I'm familiar with, why you do not wanna be a part of it, the punishment if you are found guilty, and I'm gonna let you know if I was ever a part of Wrestler's Court, so please, Quiet in the courtroom, court is in session. First, I have to let you know exactly what is Wrestler's Court, and the only way to do that is to talk about how it started. Dutch Mantel, or for newer fans of WWE, Zeb Coulter, started it years ago, back after the Bruiser Brody incident from Puerto Rico. For those of you not familiar with who Bruiser Brody was, he was a wrestler who was actually murdered in Puerto Rico after an altercation with either a booker or other wrestlers. I'm not 100% sure what happened. Dutch Mantel knew there had to be a better way for wrestlers to hash out disagreements and thus bringing forth wrestler's court. In order to make it to wrestler's court, first you have to have a defendant or a guilty, no, an offending party. Because anyone who finds themselves in wrestler's court is going to have an, a chance to plead their case. Now you might be asking, what is it that could make it to wrestler's court? It could be their positioning on the card. It could be something they do while on the road. Maybe, maybe they forgot to pick someone up or maybe someone thought they were a little sloppy backstage in the dressing room, a multitude of reasons could land someone in wrestler's court. But it was in no way, shape, or form anything directed from the office, meaning it wasn't coming on high from Vince McMahon saying, take so-and-so to wrestler's court. A lot of times, Vince would just sit off to the side with a smile, enjoying the fact that justice was being done, but the justice he was looking for getting done was just a prove a point. In fact, there was no courtroom. There was no robe. There certainly wasn't a gavel. Wrestler's court would take place in the locker room down maybe inside of catering or in the bowels of the arena before a show. Most people, once they found themselves in wrestler's court, it was not someplace they wanted to be. A lot of times the defendants were trying to keep their actions <laughs> or their, their offenses as far under wraps as possible to not make it to wrestler's court. Now, we know you would have your defendant, you would have your person being taken to court, and if you have a defendant, you also have to have a prosecutor. During my time there, the prosecutor was usually Farouk, Ron Simmons, and JBL, John Bradshaw Layfield, and always, and I mean, Every time someone went to court during my time, the man sitting with the robe, the man leading everything was the Undertaker. Prior to Undertaker, it was always my understanding that Andre was the one that was heading up the locker room, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So once word got out that there was going to be a court case, everyone stopped what they were doing, made their way to the locker room or wherever court was going to take place, and everyone took their seats. Undertaker would take his spot up in the front, and then whoever was defending the case would be with the plaintiff. And like I said, during my time, it was usually Farouk and JBL. Ron and JBL would take their place getting ready to prosecute the case. Now, the question's gonna arise, were there wrestlers above wrestlers court? Although it was never stated backstage, I personally, I can't see Undertaker, who was the head of wrestlers court. I also, I can't see a Triple H, a Stone Cold, a Shawn Michaels, a Rock. I can't see these guys go, ever being in wrestlers court because when you're making a company that much money, you're gonna get preferential special treatment. So for those top, top guys, wrestler's court probably never even entered their mind. But for the lower mid-card guys, guys like myself, you know, wrestler's court was something that was always on your mind. But that said, anytime wrestler's court was brought up and we knew that there was going to be a trial, we knew two things. One, we knew the offending party was already guilty. This was just a way of getting to it. And two, we knew that for 
20 to 30 minutes, we could let our guards down. The wrestler's court was fun for the entire locker room, except the person being placed on trial. One of the reasons you did not want to end up in wrestler's court is because undoubtedly private embarrassing information was going to get out. It was going to be made public in the entire locker room. And once it's made public there, it's gonna be made public to the rest of the world, destroying your privacy. And this could be a multitude of things. I mean, it could be a hookup gone awry, maybe an argument over money, and you don't want people to think you're cheap, or it could be you complaining to the office about your position on the card. You don't want to let everyone know that you think that you're being underutilized because you could find yourself off the show altogether. So if you're the guilty party, you want to make sure whatever your offense was stayed private, stayed to where the rest of the locker room didn't know because once the locker room know, the world knew. Now, some of these court cases, they're legendary. I mean, anyone can read about them. But the real question is, is your private information safe? If you're browsing the internet, and obviously you are, you most definitely should use a VPN. And the VPN we use here, the only VPN for us, is Surfshark. Surfshark is a browser extension that masks your online identity and keeps you safe from hackers or anyone that wants to steal your personal information for nefarious purposes. For example, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if you're not using a VPN, you're probably being tracked right now. And those companies tracking you, they probably don't have bad intentions, but if there's a data breach and someone gets a hold of your personal information, I can assure you they're not gonna use it to make your life any better. I recommend the Surfshark One package. It comes with your VPN to protect your online privacy, Surfshark Antivirus to shield your devices from harm, Surfshark Search, which allows you to surf the web without a trace, and the most comforting, Surfshark Alert, which will notify you in case of a personal data leak. And you can get the Surfshark One package for as low as $2.64 per month. Plus, if you use promo code MAVEN, get six additional months for free. And best of all, if you're not happy, Surfshark has a 30 day, no questions asked, money back guarantee. So use my link in the description and start protecting your online privacy today. Unfortunately, for those that found themselves in wrestler's court, they did not have a wrestling VPN. Before I fill you in on whether I was ever involved in wrestler's court, Let's rewind a little bit and I can tell you about the cases I am familiar with. Legendary ref and former SmackDown general manager, Teddy Long, found himself getting a certain male enhancement product and obviously willing to help the boys was making it available to them. Now, this was never be a problem. I mean, hey, we're all looking for a little help anywhere we can get it. The problem arose when it became known that Teddy was getting it for free, but charging the boys, making 100% profit for something he was getting for free. Now, my memory's a little fuzzy on what the penance was for Teddy, but the prosecutors being JBL and Ron Simmons, usually getting them a bottle of whatever it was they were drinking on, all would be forgotten. Another wrestler's court instance you might not be aware of uh, involved Edge and Christian and a specific head writer, Brian Gerwitz, who found himself in possession of a very rare comic. Now, word was that Edge and Christian maybe got their position on the card due to this comic book gift. No part of me believes that because the fact that this was over 20 years ago, and the fact that 20 years later, Edge and Christian are both still at the top of their game, they were due to find success regardless. But early Edge and Christian did find themselves in a wrestler's court over something as silly as a comic book. But the case from my time that I still remember the absolute best was for a guy who I feel was unceremoniously judged, and that was 
Mohammed Hassan. Go back to 2003. America finds itself in another war with the Middle East. Mohammed Hassan's debut happened in 2004, and his whole gimmick was being an Iranian American who suffered persecution at the hands of Americans, and he was speaking out against the prejudice he felt was directed towards him. Again, this was the character, the gimmick he was given, and in my opinion, probably one of the most difficult characters in the world to find longevity with. But that's not what would land Mohammed Hassan in wrestler's court. What landed him in court was the use of his finisher. Now, Muhammad used a version of the camel clutch as a finishing maneuver. Being that that was his finisher, he wanted to protect it like all wrestlers do. Eddie Guerrero's father invented the camel clutch. Muhammad Hassan was strictly paying homage to the Iron Sheik who used it, and he thought it would be smart to carry that forward. He, and I wasn't there, so I don't know how the conversation went, but supposedly he approached Eddie and asked if Eddie could not use that maneuver, that way protecting it when he used it as a finish. Muhammad unaware that Eddie's dad invented the maneuver, was quick to learn when Eddie told him, you only have this move because it originated in my family. Well, obviously, Hassan, who had heat backstage for whatever reason, once the boys found out that he went to one of the most respected wrestlers of all times, Eddie Guerrero, there was nowhere else for him to land but wrestler's court. So it was a day like every other, a TV taping. They gathered everyone together right outside of catering. And to be perfectly honest with you, my heart went out to Hassan. He was strapped with a very, very tough gimmick. One that was not only difficult to get over with the fans at that time, but a gimmick that was difficult with the boys backstage. Now, I don't remember exactly what Hassan's punishment was, but within seven months, he would be out of the WWE, which to me, that was punishment enough. Now, before I fill you in on whether or not I was ever a part of wrestler's court, I have to give you my opinion. Was it good? Was it bad? Was wrestler's court necessary? Or was it just a way to bully younger talent? My opinion is that wrestler's court was a necessary evil. Now, what do I mean by that? When you're on the road with people 300 plus days a year, you're obviously gonna get under people's skin. And there has to be a mechanism. There has to be something to police everyone. There has to be a way to hold people accountable. Wrestler's Court during my time did just this. I think what Dutch Mantel's vision was came to fruition because Wrestler's Court became a way to laugh at others' misgivings, their untimely remarks, or their misfortunes while being on the road without having them being held accountable by the office. Because if you find yourself in wrestler's court, trust me, that's a whole lot better than getting a call on a Tuesday from Johnny Ace saying that your services with the WWE are no longer needed. And for that, see the video I did about that. Wrestler's court was a necessary evil. It was always, it was always fun. It was always a lighthearted occasion when I was there. Now, that's maybe because I never found myself in a wrestler's court, but I came very close one time. Take yourself with me to London. We were on our first overseas trip, and the day before we were flying home, I found myself out with some of the boys, and probably tying one on way more than I should have. I knew the next day the only thing we had on the calendar was to hop a charter flight and fly home, nothing else. So. I went out and had a good time the night before. The next morning, to my bewilderment, I'm still asleep 20 minutes before we have to be in the lobby. Only person that saved me that day was Devon Dudley. Devon, knowing me, said, I'm gonna check on him, make sure he's down where he needs to be. And wakes me up, 
groggy-eyed me thinking I still have time for a shower. While he's packing my bag, yelling at me, there is no time for a shower. You, we need to be in that lobby in 20 minutes. As soon as we get to the lobby, who's the first person we come in contact with? Of course, JR, Jim Ross. And I still remember, and Devon and I still laugh about it. As soon as JR started coming in our direction, Devon puts his hand behind me on my back, holding me up in essence, and leans in my ear and tells me to shut up. JR walks by us, says, Hi, Maven. Hi, Devon. I nodded my head. And JR passed by us. More than likely, probably still smelling the faint aroma of Jack Daniels on my breath, but I definitely wasn't acting bad. That's only because Devon saved me that morning. Although I never found myself in wrestler's court, that would have been a hell of a lot better than what I did find myself in. To check out my arrest video, click the link above.